I've just traveled across the world to the islands of Vanuatu to try a route. A route that is kind of becoming very popular in America right now, but for thousands of years was only known in the Pacific Islands. A route that some say can get you drunk without any drop of alcohol. A route that's becoming pretty controversial because some people hold it very sacred while others say it's just a plant. The kava route. Okay. Let's do it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're getting ahead of ourselves. Before we figure out how that night ends, which is... I'm gonna go puke. Oh, we need some backstory on how we got here. 11 months ago, I posted this video that would forever change my life, turning me into uh, the discount Hamilton Morris. I cover kava very briefly in the video, but after it went viral, I found this random company called Karuna Kava, and I called them and said, hey, I have an idea. How's about you sends me money, I go to Fiji, and I do a full story on kava. And the owner, Ben, on the phone was like, yeah, I'll do it, but uh, you should actually go to Vanuatu, not Fiji, because I think that's where most of it's produced. And so I said, cool, but uh, there was a bit of a problem with that. It's 10 p.m. I am realizing now that I'm heading to a country that I don't know anything about. <laughs> I know nothing about Vanuatu. How I got to Vanuatu was LA to Fiji, and then from Fiji to Vanuatu. But from my flight to Fiji to Vanuatu, uh, I don't know what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting that. I was thinking like, oh, I'm in the Pacific Islands, so everyone's gonna kind of look like Samoan or like Tongan or Hawaiian, right? Nope, I'm just stupid. Wait, so what's your country called again? Nauru. Nauru. Are you mixed or are you full? Okay, I was like, damn, this is so diverse. This is crazy. So you're like, what, like a, that would make you a quarter Nauru or like a something? 2%, but I speak What do Nauru people look like? They look like Vanuatu, the Samoan. No, so they're Micronesian. Oh, I don't know any of that. What the fuck okay, so if you look at, so you look at like Vanuatu, PNG, Fijians, mm -hmm. they're, they're Melanesians. And then you've got the Polynesians. So like the Samoans, Tongans. Tongans they all look of like that. the big. Yes. And then you've got micro, small. So you've got the Kiribati, the Nauruans, the Marshallese. Oh, we are the small that. nations that are all together. Uh, I know some of you might be thinking, dude, it's been two and a half minutes. When are you going to start talking about Kaaba? I promise you, you're going to learn an insane amount about Kaaba. But in order to learn that, you have to understand a bit about the Pacific Islands because you cannot separate Kaaba from the Pacific Islands. They tell each other's story perfectly and you, there's no way to tell one story without the other. What our new friend was explaining to us is the three major ethnic groups of the Pacific Islands. And it was denoted by some French explorer in the 18, some dickhead. He identified one group as the Micronesians, or the small islands, and the people who live here are kind of Filipino looking, kind of Indonesian looking, they're a bit smaller, shorter, that's their look. Then there's Melanesians, which means the black islands, and most of the people here look African, but none of them are African. They haven't been African for maybe 40,000 years. <laughs> and then finally, there are Polynesians, who are usually much taller, much bigger, probably kind of good at rugby. But if we've learned anything from history, whenever a European goes to another place and says, this is how you guys ethnically break down, they're usually pretty fucking dumb, and that's no different here. There's a ton of variance within that. For example, in Fiji, they're technically Melanesian, but if you see Fiji people, they're like, they kind of look like a mix of Polynesia and Melanesia, and in fact, that's what they are, and that actually informs how they drink kava different from Melanesia. But uh, I think that's a good segue. Let's start talking about kava. A few thousand years ago, there was one plant, which is the father of all kava plants, that we now call Piper Wichmani. It was native to Melanesia around north of Vanuatu or Papua New Guinea, and eventually the people there noticed that if you drink it, it feels pretty funny in a good way. But this Piper Wichmani wasn't perfect. It wasn't as strong, and nor did it really feel as good as the stuff we have today. And so after generation of generation, these ancient people selected to have the strongest and best quality plants that we now call kava, or Piper Methysticum. Here's where culture and kava become one. Okay, 3,000 years ago, there was this people called the Lapita people. Came in, they spoke an Austronesian language, okay? They came in, found kava, and as they found kava, they spread kava from Melanesia throughout all of Polynesia and the rest of the islands, also spreading their language. And to this day, much of the Pacific Islands, regardless of what they look like, Melanesian, Polynesian, they speak Austronesian languages. 
and they also drink kava, but in very different ways. Okay, here's where it gets very nerdy and very cool. Here is a dendrogram, think of it like a family tree. And right here is where Piper Wichmani splits off to what we now call kava, or Piper Mythisticum. Okay. Then you will notice three categories show up, which is Polynesian varieties, two-day varieties, we're gonna get into two-day a little bit later when we start drinking, and finally, all the green is just the Vanuatu varieties. By the way, this is by no means an exhaustive list. There's many, many different varieties or cultivars is what we say. But you might ask the question, why are there so many cultivars of the same plant in one country? It's gonna get cool. So, in your language, yeah. the papaya is very sweet. How do you say it? Telesi, mm -hmm. kakasi. Telesi, kakasi. kakasi. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. How do you say it? Go for a sweet. No, no, no. No, no. No, no. No, no. No, no. What? <laughs> That's so different. <laughs> we have uh, how many languages in Vanuatu? Hundred and ten. 110 language. Oh my God. Malakula and one more. There's an island they call Malakula. Mm -hmm. Only Malakula, they have 63 language. Wow. Yeah. They're not exaggerating. And in fact, there's 138 languages in Vanuatu. How Vanuatu is set up is it's 83 different islands all in one country. And it's around the population of Cincinnati. It's 300,000 people. But there's 138 languages in there. So essentially it's so densely populated with languages that every village or every town you go to has a different language. And to clarify, I don't mean dialect. I don't mean accent. I mean language as in, I don't understand you even though I walked from my village to your village and I, I have no idea, right? To give you some insane perspective, I went on a road trip with the big guy, Joe, and another friend, Muka, and we did the whole island we were on at Fate in around four hours, saw the whole thing. And within two hours, how, so we're probably at like what, 10 languages we probably? 10 languages in two hours? <laughs> Holy shit. It could have been 10, it could have been five. The point is that we kept driving past these small villages of like, sometimes it looked like maybe 200 people live there. And he'd be like, yeah, they speak this language as a completely different language. They're from that island over there, right? It, it's so diverse. And if you wanna learn more about the culture in Vanuatu as a whole, on my second channel, if you guys leave a comment saying you're interested in it, I can make another video. I, I went to his village in, in Mele and I did like this whole thing about like their history, how they got there and all that. So if you want. That reminds me, I've not posted in a while because I spent the last month making maybe one of the best videos I've ever made about a, a substance from uh, Soviet Russia. Very interesting, but YouTube took it down. So I had to post it just on my Patreon. So subscribe to my Patreon, link in description. It is one of my best videos, 30 minutes and just mwah, it is it is worth your time, I promise. But what this has to do with kava is each one of these languages, as you can imagine, has its own culture associated with it. And that culture developed through isolation within themselves. And that happened over many, many, many generations. Well, each one of those cultures often has their own kava plant that they've spent generations cultivating that it's unique to them. It's their own cultivar unique to them with its own chemical profile, its own effects, its own look. And so that's why when you look at these long lists in Vanuatu of these different cultivars, it's because each one of them is associated with different villages and different peoples, different cultures from different islands. It's really cool. Imagine having a psychoactive plant associated with your specific people. <laughs> That's so cool. But now it's time to talk a little bit about chemistry and I got a pretty cool special guest. Two so minutes, mate. Okay. Let me... <laughs> when he finishes the coffee, that means fuck off. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> I've rated the questions from nerdy to not nerdy. Go ahead. <laughs> I was actually pretty nervous for this interview because I was told I have 10 minutes to do it. And on top of that, he said he wanted me to read his paper called Use of SSR markers and an FTIR chemometrics to assess the nobility of kava cultivars from the Pacific. And I read that whole nother thing. So honestly, going into it, I was like, is this guy a total asshole? But he actually was not. He was actually a very, very sweet man, but he was French. <laughs> okay, you said in the paper, uh, the most interesting kava lactone is Cavain. why do you say that? By far, it has been well documented because- um... Okay, who is this guy? His name is Vincent LeBeau, and from my understanding, he's essentially the number one researcher on kava on the planet. He is truly a kava genius, and I think the interview was like maybe 20, 30 minutes. The whole interview is, is a gold mine if you're into super nerdy stuff. I will post that on my second channel 
in a couple weeks or a week, okay? So just go there. But before I let him answer that question I asked, let's understand the basics of the chemistry, which first thing, the active chemicals in kava are called kava lactones. There are well over 20 kava lactones, but there are pretty much six that people focus most of their attention on and have the most influence on how it feels. As you can imagine, different cultivars of kava have different ratios of these kava lactones, potentially resulting in slightly different effects, even though I asked the professor and he said, most people, if anyone, really can't tell the difference in the effects just by drinking and the feeling. Now, in his paper he had me read, which is also where we got that dendogram from earlier, he says that cavein is the most interesting kava lactone of all the kava lactones. So I asked him why. Why do you say that? By far, it has been well documented because um, what consumers or drinkers want, drink kava, and within a few minutes, uh, have the relaxing feeling. Okay. And, and caffeine acts very, very rapidly. Basically, it's a muscular relaxant. It works on the spinal cord. Uh, we know that this particular compound, this analyte, works very, very fast and is metabolized very fast. In other words, you, you drink kava, a good variety rich in caffeine, you have the good feeling that you are looking for, the muscular relaxant feeling, and within an hour it's gone. Mm. So you go to bed and the next day you are completely fresh. On the other hand, some kava lactones like dihydrocavain and dihydromethacin, they work very slowly. So you drink kava, you are not sure that you are feeling something. You drink another shell, you drink another shell, and the next day you have a terrible... And anymore. that's why the two days, like people say it gets you messed up too because they keep drinking it, gets them loaded. Yes, and the next day you have a terrible uh, fatigue and the hangover. All noble varieties are very rich in cave, and this is what consumers want. Now, what are these noble varieties he's talking about? In kava, there are noble varieties and two-day varieties, and they are quite different. Noble varieties are essentially the good stuff, and that's what pretty much everyone wants to drink, especially on a daily basis. They have high levels of cavein. In fact, the professor says in a good noble variety, it's upwards of 20 to 30% of the kava lactones in it is cavein. And this means generally it's gonna feel a bit cleaner, it's going to hit you stronger, and on top of that, it's going to go away much faster, meaning you're gonna get better sleep and wake up not groggy. On the other hand, two-day varieties have high levels of the kava lactones dehydromethistocene and dehydrocavain, which essentially, as he explained, take much longer to hit you, but also last longer, meaning that's why they call it two-day. You're gonna wake up in two, like it, it lasts for two days. You often have a version of a hangover, and no one really on the island, if you said, hey, I have some strong two-day, no one's gonna wanna drink that stuff in Vanuatu. I've heard rumors of some villages using it for special occasions like ceremonies because apparently it can get you a little bit more messed up, but there's higher levels of nausea, there's higher levels of lethargy. But most of us around the world, if you try kava, are never going to have the chance to try two-day because I think it's actually illegal to export two-day in Vanuatu. You only want noble varieties. The last two chemistry questions we have to answer is, is it safe and what's up with extracts? The first argument for its safety is this. Yeah, we, we, we drink kava here on a daily basis. Half of the population drinks, half doesn't drink. Mm -hmm. Statistically, if we had the, a side effect, it would be very easy to detect it. What Lebo is saying is 50% of the population of Vanuatu drinks kava and much of them do it daily, while the other 50% doesn't drink kava. So you essentially have a better clinical trial on safety than any university could ever do. And the study's been going on for literally hundreds of years, and the results are, we don't really see a huge difference in the two populations. So if someone were to ask me, Meta, do you think kava is safe? I would say, generally speaking for most people, yeah, it's pretty safe. Especially if you're using it to get away from alcohol, it is much safer. In fact, in Vanuatu, I was told when alcoholism started to get really bad there, they pushed for kava consumption over it, and it actually helped a lot of people. Obviously, new evidence can come out, more research is needed, but it's also important to acknowledge what kava actually is. In Vanuatu, we have a legal definition for the word kava, which is the traditional beverage produced by cold water extraction of the underground organs of the plant. Hypermesis. You don't call caffeine pills coffee. You don't call flour and eggs dough, you call it flour and eggs. So taking the kava plant and extracting the kava lactones using ethanol or acetone, aka extracts, that is not kava, 
that is kava lactones and a lot of other stuff it's extracting. That's why the professor and myself can say with some level of certainty that kava, generally speaking for most people, is pretty safe. But we're saying kava, not just kava lactones and all this like extract stuff. The reason why that distinction is so important is because in the early 2000s, a lot of Western nations actually banned kava because there was cases of liver toxicity associated with it. But the thing about those cases is it was liver toxicity associated with kava, meaning these people could have been doing a ton of other things, but they're gonna blame it on kava because that's the new supplement in town, right? And on top of that, most of these cases of liver toxicity were associated with kava extracts, not kava. I could honestly go on and on about about this, but when you read about like kava toxicity on the liver, it's just a whole bunch of people saying, yeah, it's potentially liver toxic, yet they have really no actual evidence of it being any more liver toxic than acetaminophen. In fact, I'm pretty sure acetaminophen, aka Tylenol, would be way more liver toxic. But again, I don't know. It could very well be liver toxic. It could be that Pacific Islanders have certain genes that allow them to drink more kava. Like, I'm not a doctor, there's a lot more evidence that could be shown, but I get kind of fired up about this because it just kind of smells like a little bit of weird racism. You have this practice that has been done for hundreds and hundreds of years by millions of people of different nations and it's they happen to be black and brown and like the West is just like, can we really trust it, brother? And then like does this weird bastardization with the whole process and then somehow finds like, well, it, it sounds like it could be uh, toxic. It's like, no, you're fucking up weird version of it is maybe toxic, maybe, but like the actual practice is not like, what the fuck? Also alcohol, are you fucking kidding me? Alcohol, alcohol is so toxic. It causes cancer, liver, so oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm calm now. A lot of people, when they hear all this kind of stuff, usually go towards, oh, we should ban extracts. And to clarify, I know a lot of people who are like that, I don't think we should ban extracts. In fact, I don't really have a problem with extracts personally. I know tons of companies, I'm friends with some of them. Some of them wanna give me money who make extract stuff and I see really no problem with that. Yeah, there's not as much uh, scientific evidence on if it's safe or not, but generally speaking, I can say with some level of certainty that I would much rather drink a kava extract over a beer. I really am being serious. I would just say if you are going to do a kava extract, I would suggest just for cultural respect reasons and just safety reasons, don't call it kava. Let's say it's a kava lactone extract. There's kava lactones in it, but don't call it kava because that's quite literally legally not kava. <laughs> also, a bit of a flex, the company that paid for me to go to Vanuatu, uh, Karuna Kava, they, in their drinks, don't use any extracts, which most companies I'm familiar with do use extracts they actually make the kava. Like they make straight up kava and then flavor that. So uh, yeah, pretty cool. Um, link in the description. But now it's time to have some fun and try the stuff. Well, yes, cause like many years ago, they- I hope oh. we gotta do this. Bottle, you are a legend. No. Oh, let's go, let's go. Can I pour a bit more out? <laughs> Give more <laughs> Oh, it smells like grass. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. What are you doing? Ah! Shit! So I tapped out. Where's my punch? Ooh. It, uh, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> it tastes different. This was taken literally two hours after me getting off the plane to Vanuatu, and they were just immediately into like, you gotta start drinking, let's get into it, you know? But like I said, this stuff tasted different than any kava I've ever drinking. And I've drinking a lot of kava. This stuff tasted like weird. And we later are going to find out why it tastes so different and also why that guy said you're a legend if you drink the whole thing, yet most people didn't drink the whole thing. By the way, the kava that I'm used to, that's nothing. That I would, I would drink in 10 times that amount of kava and felt still nothing. So I was, I was not scared. It's milkier than the kava I'm used to, like the dry stuff from the States. It, it tastes fresher and it tastes generally just better. It's not as numbing too on the mouth. It's not like killing my mouth with numbness. Um, it's kind of cool. Everyone's kind of tripping. Even the fucking people who are actually from Vanuatu are like, I'm not drinking that shit. How much did you finish? Brother. <laughs> <laughs> not to call anyone a pussy, but I think I'm the only one who finished the whole thing, so. 
Someone immediately told me to sit down after they saw how much I drank, and I was waiting for the effects. I honestly did not expect to feel anything, but uh, mm, maybe like 10 minutes later, I am messed up. <laughs> <laughs> That's Come stuff, out. that's strong, dude. Yeah. Oh my God, how much did you drink? I didn't finish my follow-up. You didn't finish it? Yeah. Oh, uh, are you feeling it? Yeah. Fuck. Okay, um, wow. Uh, um, 15 minutes has passed maybe? I don't know. Um, my lips are numb. Uh, there's a ringing in my ears. <laughs> I'm fucked up. Uh, I tried to participate in a conversation. I, I honestly didn't know what was going on. I'm gonna be honest. I tried, um, but oh my God, it's it's kind of hard. <gasps> a doggy. Hello, doggy. <gasps> oh, you're a great guy. You're just a you're a fantastic fellow. Oh oh my God, a doggy attack. Oh, this is the greatest day ever. Oh gee. Why am I like this? The filming stops at this point because it got pretty hard to walk or talk. <laughs> it was a different feeling than Kava that I have ever experienced and I'm not going to lie, it was, it was kind of nice. I definitely enjoyed it. It's a unique feeling, but it's something that I think a lot of people can kind of relate to because it's very similar to fermented juice. Drunkenness, but without it being heavy, like my body didn't feel heavy or like weighed down. And it was super energetic. Like I felt this spine surge of electricity at my spine. I, would, I wanted to dance, I wanted to do everything, but I was definitely inhibited. But my mind wasn't. I didn't think any differently. I was a little goofier and looser, but it was just like driving a car where the car's all messed up. Where the driver, I'm fine, but this car, it was just hard to maneuver my body and my mouth and every, it was, it was funny, it was fun. But as this was my first night, I was kind of left with more questions than answers. Why did it taste different? How did they make it? I thought this was supposed to be some like ceremonial thing, but it kind of feels like we're just getting messed up right now. And finally, why was it so fucking strong? <laughs> Wait, is this the village? Yeah. This is the village. Hey, we are here, so I think it's time to switch to the nice camera. Joe took me to his village called Mele, where there was a celebration of someone's life. It was the fifth funeral day of one of their aunts. And so I spent the whole day talking to people, eating food, interviewing people, learning about the culture, the history. It was maybe one of the best days of my entire life. I'm not exaggerating, it was, it was the best. It looks like meat. It looks like chicken. <laughs> I thought it was chicken. The red color is like chocolate. Oh my God, yeah. it's so good. Yeah. But after a full day, around 3 p.m., Muka, who's also from that village, said that's when the Nakamals open. Now, what is a Nakamal? It's essential to understanding Kava in Vanuatu, and it's essentially the cultural epicenter of a village. It's like their town hall. It's where the chief spends a lot of time. It's where a lot of people go to drink Kava and talk about whatever needs to be talked about. If there's a, a problem between different villages or a problem between people or people wanna get married, you go to the Nakamal and the chief facilitates. And it's it's a very sacred place traditionally. You will experience a traditional Nakamal a little bit later when we try the Pasisi method of Kava, but Nakamal as a term has actually evolved in a weird way in Vanuatu. Over the last 50 years, the culture around Kava in Vanuatu really started to shift from something that was very sacred and, and let's say just special. It was only drinking during certain occasions and it gradually shifted in Vanuatu to kind of an everyday thing. And as that shifted, so did the term Nakamal from something that was a very special meeting place to kind of just a kava bar. This is how you do like a, like a, this is a traditional, yeah. what do you call it, a nakab? Nakamal. Nakamal. Yeah. Nakamal. This is a kava bar. Kava bar. Hey, 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 here you are. And the sun just fucked up my shot. So we're just gonna explain it. And my hemorrhoids are really bad right now. So we're, we're positioned like this, cause it helps a little bit. <laughs> God, it hurts so bad. So the way Nakamos work is a scoop system. This is a scoop. Each of them costs 50 cents. And when you first start out drinking kava at like three to 5 p.m., you ask for three scoops or you just say 150. Can I get three 150? He gives you three scoops, you take the shot, and then you wait. You sit down, you talk, maybe 
for 10, 20 minutes, okay? As you start to feel it, you go for your next shot. Now after the first 150 shot, every shot after that, most people just get 100, 100, 100 as the night goes on. The village of Mele is pretty big. It's around five to 7,000 people. And so there's actually Nakamals spread all across the village. But certain people, as you can imagine, have certain Nakamals that they prefer. Either you know the owner better, or the biggest predeterminant is what I was told, is that it's whoever has the best kava. So it's kind of if they source their kava from a good source, if they mix it really strong, that's how people decide if that's their Nakamal. How about cold? Yeah. I like the rain. Do you like the rain? No. No. Yes, <laughs> you? So in America, there's like this idea that here, this is traditional, right? Which it is, it is traditional. Yeah. But I think people think that like when they do it, they are like, we're all in a circle, all the tribes together and we're talking and we're talking about the day or whatever. Don't, don't get it wrong that it's only a traditional drink. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's, it's also just for fun. Yeah. So that kind of answers my earlier question of, I thought this was traditional. Well, it's both. It's traditional sometimes, but it's also recreational, especially in recent years. Now, when we go outside of the village of Mele or any village, you go to the town, you have expats and tourists and native people all going to the same Nakamals, right? Now, there are obviously some key differences between these type of Nakamals. For one, they're very much into trendiness. One of my friends, Aaron, who owns a really, really cool Nakamal, was talking about how his Nakamal a couple years ago was the trendy spot, like everyone wanted to go there. But now it's more into like, the trendiness is going to Nakamals that have the window system. The window system is brilliant. You have a Nakamal that owns the land and then you have all these vendors that rent out a spot to sell. What, what is this? So it says Morning Fresh. This is Kava from Ombrim Island. Why is it called Morning Fresh? Because in the morning, you are fresh. Okay, example. so is it a different variety? It is a different variety, it's from Ambrims. Well, like it's a new name, it's not a traditional name, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But they call it morning fresh. And when you say morning fresh, you know it's a good cava from Ambrims. This is a completely different one. This is Santo, Santo, Santo. Cava coming from Santo, which doesn't mean much just like this, but Got normally it. it's quite strong. But the funny thing is people are loyal to their vendors. They like to go to their specific vendors. No matter where you are, village or town, it's all a uh, 50 cents a scoop, same size scoop. The last thing about the culture of Nakamals is that you'll often see people munching on food while they're drinking kava. It's not necessarily that we're hungry. In fact, a lot of the time when you drink kava, you don't get hungry. You lose the want to eat. You're actually doing what they call wash mouth. It's just, they're like, <laughs> It is such a disgusting drink. People are just like, please anything to get this out of my mouth. No matter how long people have been drinking their entire lives and they're like, I hate this. I hate this so much. There's also a huge culture of spitting. The spitting is normal. Everyone just spits here. It's not an offensive thing. Kava tastes bad, but everyone just spits. There's literally so many cool things I could tell you about these. Uh, a couple things I forgot. The cool thing about some Nakamals is that some Nakamals are popular because they're wash mouth, they're food, which is like, if you want a bag of peanuts, 50 cents. If you want a wing, it's like a dollar fifty, right? Some people choose Nakamals based on how good their food is. The other thing is that it's very, I think in all the Nakamals I went to in town, they have these faucet uh, stations where you can wash out your cup because you're going to give your cup right back to the vendor right after you drink it and then you use it to uh, wash out your mouth from, you know, the nasty taste. Back to hemorrhoid cam meta. I'm about to show you some very cool footage of a method of making kava called pasisi. But if we want to fully appreciate the method, we have to understand how diverse making kava is around the Pacific Islands. In the West, I think we have a certain idea of kava drinking that looks a very certain way, which is a circle of people there's a guy who's the chief at the top of the circle and he has this big bowl in front of him and he's mixing up the kava and then passing out the kava and coconut shells, right? That's not a thing in Vanuatu. I don't know all the cultures, obviously, but from my understanding, they don't do it like that at any part of Vanuatu. Actually, I wanna backtrack. I don't know. Uh, I was told this, but uh, there's 138 different languages. This is a very diverse place. I have no idea about what everyone's doing, you know? They don't do that because that's actually traditionally a Polynesian thing. They in fact do that in Fiji as well, uh, but it's this certain way that's, that bowl is called a tanoa. That's what you mix it in. But there's a few key differences with that method. One of the differences is that kava is actually different. They use a different part of the kava plant when they make that traditionally. And on top of that, it's usually and almost always dried, which answers one of my earlier questions of why does it taste so different in Vanuatu? 
Well, in Vanuatu, they only drink fresh kava and they actually drink a different part called the rhizome. We'll get into the details of all like how it's grown and how it's harvested and all that in a later video, but yeah. I'm underselling it. If this video goes well, I have another video locked and loaded where I literally stay on a kava farm and study how do they grow it? How do they harvest it? How do they treat it? How do they ship it out to you? How do they make the most potent kava possible? Here's the teaser thumbnail. Yeah, yeah. I promise it won't disappoint, but this video has to perform, so share or whatever. The other key difference, which is why I think a lot of Nivan people do not want to drink this Fiji or Polynesian type of kava is that this Tanoa kava is quite diluted from my understanding. That's why when I first went to Vanuatu and had one shell, I was like gone because I was used to drinking this Tanoa method, which is traditionally much, much, much weaker. It's just more water. It's not worse kava by any means. They just traditionally like to put more water in it. But I can't tell you how many times I talked to people from Vanuatu and I was like, would you ever like do that method? And they're like, no, that's gross. Like I don't wanna drink that much fluid to get a fraction of the feeling. But if we talk about just Vanuatu, there's actually tons of different ways they make kava just in that country. Traditionally, I think most of the islands use the rock method where they use a big rock and they smash up the kava on another rock and then you take that up and then you strain that and that's the rock method. The second method, which is becoming very popular is the mince method, which is where they use a mincer and they finely mince the kava, but they do it multiple times over to get a very fine mince and then they strain that out and then that's the minced method. The most famous method is from the island of Tana and uh, it's, it's less than pleasant. When I first arrived, I was told I should go to the island of Tana because the legend is that a virgin boy must chew the kava and then you drink that. It's not a legend. That's that's actually what they do. Uh, they they have a kid, a guy, a, a young man, uh, a boy, chew up the kava, the rhizome. They just put it in their mouth, nom, 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 the ton, and then the kid goes, bleh. Dinner's served. Oh my God. Ooh. I was planning a trip to Tana. Thank goodness I ran out of money. I did not have enough money for that trip and I just couldn't afford to go to Tana. But, uh, thank you. But hey, if you guys wanna give me enough money, I'll, I guess I'll do it. Uh, you guys better give me a lot of money. But the most potent method in all of Vanuatu, I was told, is from the island of Pentecost called the Pasisi method. Since the moment I landed, everyone was saying, you have to try this method. But the problem is the only people that know how to actually properly do this method are people from Pentecost and a few neighboring islands. And Pentecost is a far way away. Also, Pentecost, crazy place. In the south of Pentecost, they literally have traditional bungee jumping where they tie their feet with vines and then they jump off like 20, it's wild. But people would say you have to be careful with Pasisi because Pasisi is legitimately three to five times stronger than the ordinary methods. And I didn't understand, like, how do they make it so strong? I thought my chances of trying Pasisi were cooked uh, by the end of the trip, but I, through a stroke of luck, I happened to make friends with a guy who is from Pentecost at my hotel, and he happened to know a Pentecost chief, or like a high-level Pentecost chief, that was in town, and he happened to have enough time to do a Pasisi for me. If I'm waiting for you. Oh, he's excited to f me up. <laughs> yeah. People from Pentecost, don't play around and say you like to drink kava. <laughs> we are here. Oh my god, and they said this is a proper nakama, like a traditional nakama. Yo, we got the roots. Ooh, ayo. Uh, <laughs> Come on. Hello. Uh, pleasure to meet you. Pleasure. Meta. Derek. Derek. Derek is the chief, and Derek is a pretty high level chief in Pentecost. I believe he's like almost top three chiefs in all of the island of Pentecost. We can talk about culture and politics more in depth in another video, but all of Vanuatu has a chief system. So there's the government, but then each village has chiefs and islands have like hierarchies of chiefs. How you know Derek is a high level chief is you can look at these boar jaws. So say it again. So the more curved the tusk is, that makes it more valuable. Mm. Those are a measurement of his status and he killed those boars. In fact, to become a chief, the ceremony is in a day, you have to kill 10 boars through a wooden spike in the head. And you kill it right through the head. Uh, right through the head and you, are, you have to kill 10 big, not one. In one day? In one day. 10 pigs? 10 pigs in one day. 
I believe he's killed 30 boars in his day. A good chief is very important because if there's any problems within villages or, or village in village or anything, they are like mediators. They are kind of the wise people. How long have you been chief? Uh, class four. Class four? Fourth yeah. grade. Uh, fourth grade. Yeah. Wait, what? Yeah. yeah. How? How are you chosen to be a chief at fourth grade? Was my father is a higher stronger chief. Okay. And once... Uh, he passed? Yeah. Wow, you started. He inherited. So, uh, you inherited so early. Uh, I, was, I started so early because my father is a chief. Did you have to do anything special when you became yeah. chief as a ch kid? Oh, uh, yes. The peaks. So you had to do the test, but like, did you still like do kid stuff or were you like had to do work? You have to do work. What kind of work did you do? Uh, garden, gardening. Okay. That's like a chief job, gardening? Yeah. Okay. We're gonna learn a lot more about the culture from Derek later, but it was time for me to learn what Pasisi was. And I really had no idea what to expect because all I knew it was insanely strong. They somehow use a specific type of coral and you do this type of motion. And every time you do it, it goes whick, 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 which I was like, I don't, I don't even know, like, I have no idea what that would be. That's what we used to grind. That's the one I was. Are they, why are they different sizes? Depends on which size you want and which, how, how heavy it is to you. Yeah, that cleared up nothing. Somehow I was more confused on how the whole process works after seeing those. But after they chopped up and peeled the root, I started to understand what it was for. Okay. Yeah, how long have you been doing this? Since he was a little boy. Really? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. These spikes are essentially the grinders, and they told me that they were made out of brain coral that's been shaped into this spike to grind it. Don't quote me on that, because there was a bit of a language barrier between us, so I could be wrong, but I think that's what they said. Can I try? Yeah, you can. I can try? Yes. You're, oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, local uh, stool for you. Uh, here? This is your timber. Okay. This is your stone. The stone. Okay. Take three pieces. Okay. You got three. Try to make up a little cut. One, 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 one space yeah. where this uh, thing can go in. Right, baby. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Hole. yeah. Yeah. Watch your finger. Watch your finger. Watch your finger. Yeah. Keep on bragging now. Yes. 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 yes, yes. Man, this is difficult. Yeah. See, what time he does it? Use your other other hand to. There you go. There you go. Oh, I think you have one already yeah. down there. See? Hey, oh, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever like, if you want kava alone, you're like at your house. You can yeah. just do this? Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's nice. So you don't have to go and buy it. That's, no. yeah. Oh, that's cool. Well, that's actually an interesting side point. In Vanuatu, you'd imagine everyone to make their own cob at home to like save money or it's easier, right? No. Pretty much everyone that I asked was like, you would never make it at home. It's way too much work. You just wait for the Nakamals to open. Wow, I, let's see how much work I did. That's it. That's good, I got. Yeah. A little pile. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's what you drink? Yeah, but the opposite. That's yours. Oh, but that's strong. That's not diluted. Yeah, and that's why Pasisi is so strong. Usually you dilute kava when you grind it up and squeeze it. Nope, it's just a hulking man just cold pressing that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever done Pasisi? Yeah. Okay, okay. Two times. Two times. It's enough. <laughs> a special way to fold it. Time. 
After the first strain, it is time for a prayer. What a praise, glory, more I come back when I'm you. When I'm you, Jesus, my love, my love, and this love, cry. Oh, 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 oh. Are you ready to drink now? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. How are they going to say this? Yeah, that's how they call you. Is he being extra? Is that like that's part of it? That's part of it. That's part of it. Okay, cool. You pulled. Okay. Okay. You drink now. Okay, I drink now. Yeah. Like this. And like this. Drink. Okay. okay. Got it. You got it. Just one shot. Yeah. Okay. Say it, Malugu. 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 Drink. Okay. Malugu. Oh my gosh. That's one. That's strong. Yeah. Okay. Good. Very good. Thank you. That tastes good. Yeah. That's the best tasting cob I've ever had in my life. Really? Okay, calm it down, Mr. Flattery. It tastes really good. Mm, yum, yum. It tastes horrendous. That just tasted a little bit less horrendous than what I'm used to, but my mouth was instantly numb, like just ugh, ugh, nasty. Thank you very much, man. Breadfruit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I've never heard of that. You never had that. In US, you, you never had that. No, I've never heard so Once they, they roast it. Oh, it's roasted? Yeah, yeah it's roasted. I'll try it. It's very uh, fibery. It's no, roasted. It's nice. nice? <laughs> oh, whoa. It tastes like bread. <laughs> wow. Texture, flavor. Uh, wow. You, you Good. <laughs> I was being polite. I did not enjoy that. It, it it tastes like fruit that tastes like soggy bread. It's it's not my jam, but you know, don't yuck someone's yum, as they say. It's just definitely not for me. The chief told me to drink, so I can't say no. Of course. So you, it's been like two minutes, or maybe a minute. Two minutes, yeah. I feel like, yeah, it's coming on already. Not a good sign. It should take at least five minutes. Uh, feeling after one to two minutes, too soon to feel something. Normal effects, yeah, feeling a bit talkative, relaxed, lethargic, I want to sit down. I don't feel, oh, oh wait. <laughs> Um, you feel it? Yeah. Oh, that's strong. That's <laughs> very strong. That's the real test. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. It's, wow. It's, it's better than mint. It's way better than minced. Yeah. It's way better than minced. Feels the same as kava, but it's it's really intense. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. It's like having three or four shells at once. Uh, the history of Gava. Mm -hmm. Gava was born with a special tool, but once Gava becomes money, so we use it in many different ways. But in traditional way, this is how we use Gava. Mm -hmm. This method is not for money ever. Yeah, it's not for money. It's not for money. It's, yeah. not for money. it's for people, it's for community, mm -hmm. it's for everybody. You have a chance to enter a custom Nagaman. You are a special one. Because everything inside a custom Nagaman is free to you. Mm. We never sold anything. It looks like you... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So that's great. <laughs> it's a you, yeah. Pasisi is the yeah. best method. <laughs> we are privileged to have you yeah, it is it is my honor truly thank you so much i appreciate it for life uh, huh <laughs> yeah i wasn't kidding around it was hard to keep myself together uh ringing in my ears uh the it was like kind of spinny not nauseating it was a little bit of nausea there's a slight amount of euphoria but it's not something that's just oh this feels amazing it's just like a oh this is kind of fun you know 
Oh my gosh, this is so intense. Let's check on, let's check in on Aaron. Yeah, it's definitely hitting me. Wait, wait till you have the second shell. Wait, we're going again? Yeah, we're going again. Uh, how many do they usually do? Three. How much do you do? I... Oh, he's a senior. Yeah, senior. About five. Yeah. Do you do Pasisi every night? But in the islands, yes. Okay. Of course. Every okay. night. It's difficult here because we don't plant kava here. But in the islands, because I have my own. You have your own plants? His own garden of kava. Oh. I have my own garden of kava. Everyone has. So you want to drink every day, it depends. On, on your garden? On, on the garden. Well, okay, okay. So the effects are... I don't know what it's like. It's very intense. It's very lethargic, and there's a slight, slight amount of nausea, like just in the background. But it's it's definitely manageable. I like it. It feels good. Um, but I already know it's in about ten minutes. It's going to be hitting even harder. Are you guys generally um, quiet in Nakama in the traditional Nakama? Or yeah, it's, you it's like you're meditating, but you can also like tell stories and. Okay. But it's a very like quiet, quiet. peaceful space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how old were you when you tried kava for the first time? About 18 years. 18 years old? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I actually asked this question to almost everyone I met over there, and everyone's response was like 18 at the very lowest, but most people like mid 20s is when the first time they tried it. And I asked this one mom, like, wait, whoa, like, are just kids not sneaking out to do this stuff? And they said, no, no, our kids sneak out to do stuff, but when they sneak out, they're gonna probably do like alcohol or other stuff. Kaba, she said was like, it's kind of sometimes seen as an old person thing, but yeah, most people start around mid twenties. Did you like it? Of course. You did? US, we drink wine, but in uh, US, our wine is Kaba. Okay, so you kind of felt like I'm a man now, I feel good. Yeah, Okay. I can drink Kaba now. Okay, cool. Yeah. Were you like excited when you were 17? Yeah. Oh, you're like, oh, I can't wait to try it? Yeah. That's fun. What's the what's the highest? Uh, seven. Oh my gosh, how were you? <laughs> were you... Smashed. Smashed? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> seven is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that conversation brings up a very interesting theme that I noticed while over there. I would talk to a lot of foreigners or expats who were in Vanuatu, and I would talk to them about these custom traditional nakamals, and they would all have a very similar talk about, oh, these are very sacred, very special, not a lot of foreigners get to go there, they're very rare nowadays on this island, blah, 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 blah. And they would almost over-ceremonialize it, almost like fetishizing it. And when I was actually in this custom Nakamal, yes, there was definitely a sacred vibe in there, but also notice they're definitely trying to get me as messed up as possible because it's kind of funny. There was this fun line that we played of, this is a special place, so don't be disrespectful, but also, we're a whole bunch of guys in here having a good time getting smashed together. It was a good vibe. I bring that up because I've been to a few kava bars in America and it gets really gross and fetishizy very quickly. Prime example, I was in <laughs> at this one kava bar and the guy who was serving me, he handed me an actual coconut shell and I asked him, hey, do you guys ever flavor your stuff, have flavors? And he got mad at me and he was like, no, we only do traditional kava here. What? Your name is Todd and you're a Caucasian serving me. How is that traditional? Like, like, how are you gonna gatekeep a culture that's not yours? That's super cringy. What are you doing? It gives white girl yoga vibes so hard in the worst ways. It's, there's nothing wrong if you are not Indian and you like yoga. There's nothing wrong if you like Kava and you're not Vanuatu from the Pacific Islands. The problem comes when you fetishize the culture and you strip it of its like humanity. The, the, there's a way to pay homage to a culture in a respectful way that's not like, like uh, douchey. A good example is Karuna Kava. Before I took their money, I told Ben on the phone very clearly, hey, if I'm gonna take your money, I'm not Nivan from Vanuatu, you're not Nivan. So we have to make sure that there's a way to make sure that there's money going back to that actual like country and that I'm helping those people. It's not just two non-Nivan people making money off this culture, right? And I accepted their money because Ben on the phone was immediately like, yep, 100%. That is totally cool if you take another sponsor or whatever, totally cool with that. And, and when I went to visit Karuna Kava's bar in Idaho, that was like a something that I really fell in love with, which was, 
Ben very much tried to pay homage to the culture of Kava in whatever which way. He never acted like it was his culture. He never tried to gatekeep. He also adapted it to what was relevant to his people of flavoring it in certain ways. So some of his flavors are like super cool and super fun and I good. But yet he also understands the very important and practical thing of I'm not doing extracts with some like bastardization. This is real kava and he's very like, he used to do everything by hand, every batch. Now he has a little bit of like a machine thing, but like it's still real kava. Now here's the shameless plug. I, Karuna Kava is obviously, they make amazing products, but also and potentially more importantly, he's a good man and it's a good company. I, I met firsthand so many people who changed their lives through Karuna Kava and through Kava because of alcoholism and a lot of stuff. Like it really changed lives. And I can honestly say supporting this company is, is it's a good, they're good people. And if you're curious about starting your own Kava business and how to do it ethically like Ben, my best advice, and I'm going to supply some good people to do business with at the end of the video from Vanuatu, pay top dollar. You want good quality stuff, you want ethical stuff, you need to pay top dollar. That's for business owners and consumers, pay top dollar. No different than the specialty coffee industry. If you wanna pay the lowest price for coffee, cool. You're gonna get terrible product and you're definitely going to be borderline enslaving or doing some very unethical business practices. But if you pay top dollar, you're going to get the best quality product, which is very important in Kava for a lot of reasons. And you're gonna make sure that the people actually doing it are getting paid a fair wage. Very important. But wait till the end for good contacts. And if you want some Karuna Kava, it is down in the description. 18 plus, please. Okay, back to me drinking Kava. At this point, I was pretty smashed already and I could have sworn I could understand Bislama. Oh one fifty, everyone. Wait, you said three shell, one fifty. Yeah, that's three, it. Three shells and three scoops. Yep. And he puked yeah, after yeah, that. Just fuck. Well, looking back at the footage, it was it was pretty clear that he was saying three shell, one fifty over and over again. So that's not rocket science to figure out. That's a bummer. Let's check on on the the boys cooking. <laughs> you doing good? Yeah. Good. yeah. <laughs> You see this? Yeah. This is a special, uh, what we call uh, tam tam. Okay. The drums? Yeah, the drums. Those are actually really cool. I think they're used in a couple of different ways. One of them is transferring knowledge across long distances. For example, if someone dies, I think there's a certain rhythm that you do that will tell like neighboring villages and people outside like, hey, this person died. So that's pretty cool. I think, I, again, I could have misinterpreted, but I think. Me? Yeah. Malungo? Malugo. 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 Okay. okay. You should uh, eat some grapefruit. Grapefruit? Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> really white. Malugo. Yo, I think I'm there, man. <laughs> That's what you asked for. <laughs> you, know, you know what this feels like? It feels like if you crossed fermented juice and green stuff in one. That's what I see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's like uh, money. <clears throat> That's like money, you said? Yeah, like money. And then, it can be dyed with like a red, traditional red dye. <clears throat> so you can make like a payment if something happens, you pay a fine or something, you pay it with this man. Okay, the, the chief had me drink another, um, uh, another shell, um, and they told me that if the chief tells you to do it, you gotta do it, so I did it. And um, to clarify, that's a third shell, three. The, oh my god, I can barely walk. I'm not, I'm not with you. I probably will puke tonight, maybe. Um, I don't know. I surprisingly didn't puke. The next night when I went kava bar hopping with Aaron and his friend, yeah, that, then I puked. I for sure puked then, but that was after five shells. Oh, not to flex, but uh... Yeah, this is the coolest thing I own now. <laughs> oh! Mm, smells like kava.
The very last conversation I wanted to bring up is the most controversial conversation around Kava ever, which is, is it addictive? Ooh, I'm going to get a lot of hate for this. Yes, but listen. On my cab back to the airport, they were speaking Baslama on the radio, and the lady on the radio said, hey, if you have an addiction to fermented juice or green stuff or kava, they included kava in that. And I can speak from personal experience. I met people who were definitely addicted to kava. I met a couple of people who lived there that were expats that would literally sleep in, wake up late so that they, when they woke up, could just go to the Nakama at 3 p.m. and then get smashed, like smashed every single night, stumbling. And when I asked expats and Nivan people, yo, what happens if you don't drink your nightly kava? A lot of them say, you just can't sleep. Like it's, it's not a good night and you might wake up with some anxiety the next day, but beyond that, it's fine. Which that's where it kind of gets confusing because there's not a lot of physical withdrawals that come with kava use, even heavy, heavy kava use. So to compare heavy kava use to like heavy alcohol use, really not comparable at all. Um, they're drastically different. And I know a lot of you will be like, well, so it sounds like kava is not physically addicting, but it's mentally addicting or you can get mentally dependent. I really dislike that distinction. I understand where you guys are coming from and the science behind it, but the huge problem with that is it really makes this false dichotomy between substances of there's good ones that aren't really that bad and there's bad ones that are really bad. That's just not true. Any religious use of anything, we're talking activities, we're talking substances, we're talking anything, there is an equilibrium and if you stop doing that thing, you're going to have a reaction to that. If you work out every single day for three years, when you stop, it's gonna mess you up. You're gonna, not gonna know what to do with yourself. Your body's gonna feel weird. Same thing with kava. When cannabis was being legalized, everyone was saying that it's not physically addicting. Bro, I was smoking every single day in college. And when I stopped, I was messed up for like a week. I could not eat, I could not sleep. My thoughts were all jumbled. I couldn't think straight. It really messed me up. I don't, you know, oh, it's not the same addiction. I, I've went through a few addictions, trust me. It's a bad, it's a bad withdrawal. Not for everyone, and obviously everything has its own type. I could just go on about this. You get the point. But that's the video. I had a lot of fun doing this one. Um, I will wanna have a special thanks to Aaron for showing me around. His Nakamal is absolutely gorgeous and he makes famously good instant kava uh, if you are interested in doing business with him. Joe and Muka, you guys are the absolute best. You guys, thank you so much for showing me your area. It's so fun. Finally, John Noopa, he facilitated so much of this trip. He, he, this next video you're gonna see, he is a major, his farm is a major part of it. He has, he introduced me to everyone. A great kava source, if you wanna contact him, here's his contact information. Oh, and Michael Lizu, uh, he helped me understand certain things. Um, he also is an exporter, a uh, nice man. Um, he was raised there as well, I believe. But to clarify, this is more for like business. This is not small orders. This is for if you wanna start a business, these are the guys to talk to, so talk to them. And tell them I sent you so I can get a portion of that money. Bye-bye. <laughs> uh,